Hi, Alexey Pashkov here. In today's video we are going to talk, surprise, about the painting. But not only we are going to talk about the painting, we are going to draw a conclusion, or rather I'm going to draw a conclusion that you might not like. Or maybe, on the contrary, you will like it a lot. It all depends on where you stand on certain issues. I even begin to wonder how my audience would be divided. What percentage of people would say, yes, that's true, and what percentage would say, no, Alex, this time you've gone too far and in the wrong direction. Watch till the end and take part in the experiment. Don't forget to say in the comments about whether you liked the conclusion or not. So, we will begin, as always, with the mysterious painting. Just the way you like it. Here is the painting. And it is by Rubens. His manner, I think, is instantly recognizable. Who is depicted is also clear. Venus, of course, or Aphrodite, whatever you prefer. This goddess herself has no specific attributes, but we can easily recognize her by her entourage. Next to her is Cupid. On the ground is his quiver of arrows, which, however, he has abandoned, because both he and his mother are very cold. See how she is all shivering, poor thing? Rubens has indeed succeeded in conveying how chilly it is for her. The question is, why is she shivering? Because I cannot, for the love of me, remember a myth about freezing goddess of love. Her being born from the sea, yes, that I do remember. Her helping to kidnap Helen of Troy, yes. Her cheating on her husband, Hephaestus, also yes. But in what story do we find her suffering from cold? Well, nothing comes to mind, at least to my mind. To answer this question, let's look at some other similar paintings. Here is one. An artist who also, like Rubens, lived in the early 17th century was named Spranger. And he also painted Aphrodite. You see, she is in the back, in the background. You can make out some sort of a cave, there is a fire inside, and by this fire our poor goddess is trying to get warm. We can see her very well, but we can still guess that it is her, again by other characters accompanying her. Do you see a winged cupid? Well, that's our tell. But what about the two figures in the foreground? We have a male and a female. And if we examine a few later paintings of the same subject, it will become very clear who they are. Look, here is another Rubens. As you can see, this painting by Spranger serves as a bridge, a transitional stage between Rubens' first painting, where only the frieze and Aphrodite was depicted, and this second one, where she is already accompanied by two characters, which I repeat, in this case are easy to recognize. Of course, Bacchus, or Dionysus, the god of wine, is by her side. He offers her a cup of wine and Ceres, the goddess of fertility. She is, of course, wearing a wreath of ears. And here is the crucial point. As soon as they have arrived, Aphrodite gets warm. And the same thing happens in the paintings by other artists. For example, look at this one. Here we have Dionysus, who is traditionally clad in a tiger's skin and accompanied by a feline predator. Why Dionysus is so often accompanied by some kind of a predatorial cat? Well, that's a topic for another video. As for Ceres, she is also recognizable by ears of grain. And one can see that Venus is certainly comfortable in their company. What is this strange plot? Why is Venus freezing and then not freezing? And how did she end up in the company of Ceres and Bacchus? Well, the explanation is more simple than you think. 
Actually, those paintings are just an illustration of the, of the Latin proverb. Sina seras ad Bacchus frigid Venus. Translated, without Ceres and Bacchus, Venus freezes. To be more accurate, it was not originally a proverb, but a quote. A quote from a comedy by Tarantius. He was a Latin comedy writer, purely entertaining and light. His plays are always an array of ridiculous situations. There is always the old grumpy husband, who is in later European literature would become a husband in slippers and a flannel cap. There is the obligatory presence of the perky and cunning wife who, after putting her old husband to sleep, crawls out of the door to meet her date. There is sure to be some sort of switcheroo, mutual misunderstandings, men dressed as women and vice versa. It's all a lovely mess with a light trace of lewdness. As a rule, all ends well. So. There are these comedies by Tarantius. Uh, many of them uh, have survived. And in one of those, this very phrase appears. It goes like this. Without Bacchus and Ceres, Venus freezes, his character says. And adds, and it is true. And it is true indeed. The meaning of the phrase, I think, I think needs no explanation. I mean, one cannot wrap his head around love and romance when one has an empty stomach. And of course, a glass of wine makes any day it go smoother. You know what I mean. So that quote has stuck. It was eventually pulled from the text of Tarantius and uh, entered European literature as a proverb. You can find it in both Cicero and in later authors. And it is interesting that for Tarantius, this idea had no negative or sinful connotation. His comedies, I repeat, were intended to entertain, not make point on morality. They are ultimately about the joy of life, in which there is room for small pleasures. Guilty pleasures, maybe, but still quite excusable and innocuous. Enjoying gifts of Bacchus, Venus and Ceres all together is the case in point. But in later authors, on the contrary, this phrase takes on moralistic tone. Martin Luther, in, in one of his sermons, refers to this image and says that vices and sins tend to reinforce each other. They have a sort of dark synergy. And indeed, where Bacchus and Ceres appear, i.e. wine drinking and gluttony, there, of course, Venus, i.e. debauchery, is not far away. So the phrase remains the same, but its meaning is reversed. From praising love and life, it went to exposing venomous power of vices and extolling an ascetic way of life. But the question remains. Why was it, for the most part, the art of Netherlands that utilized this image? And it was indeed the case. I showed you some Rubens's paintings, but mostly this quote was illustrated by artists from Harlem and from other Dutch cities, mostly in the 17th century. A surge of interest in this subject is observed in a certain place and during a certain time. The question is, why? Well, as it is usually the case in the humanitarian studies, we only have theories. But in this case, a theory is witty and very convincing. And here it is. Paintings on this subject were eagerly commissioned by Harlem brewery owners. Of course, the brewing industry was well developed all around the Netherlands at the time, but especially in Harlem. And the owners of the Harlem breweries were a powerful economic force. Of course, their ego was flattered by the fact that the artists spoke of their rather mundane craft in the lofty language of ancient imagery. And whose ego would not be flattered? Moreover, this subject, Bacchus, Ceres and Venus, perfectly fitted the description of the process of brewing. 
What is beer made of? Grain. And with the ears of grain, it was Ceres usually depicted. She is the goddess of fertility. As for Bacchus, it would seem that Bacchus is the god of wine. And indeed, he is usually represented with the clusters of grapes. But at the same time, let us not forget that Bacchus is not only the god of wine in the narrow sense. Bacchus is also the god who taught people the very process of winemaking. Bacchus is a deity who has a certain technological knowledge, if you will. And by combining that very knowledge of where you have to pour the mold, heat it, submerge it, evaporate it, and so on, by combining that knowledge with the raw material that is used as the basis for making alcohol, which in this case is the grain, and by adding fire, you end up with that very coveted beer. And that is to say, the figures of Bacchus and Ceres represent different components and stages of the brewing process. Ceres stands for materials required, Bacchus for technological know-how, and Venus, since she is usually represented warming herself by the fire, symbolizes the heat, which was also an indispensable part of the process. Now, personally, I love how wittily and subtly the artists of the time tried to please their customers. Again, they were not talking about a noble or sublime subject, but they found a way to talk about it gracefully and tastefully. And that's where I come to the very conclusion that, as I said, some people may like and some people may not like. You know, I've been in the business of telling people about art for many years, both adults and children. And I have always been trying to put one idea across. If you spend so much time studying the subject, it would be better if the subject was also of some practical use to you. And this whole story I've just told you is a great example of what kind of practical use that might be. A person who is well acquainted with ancient myth, literature and works of art can use this very material, processing it a little bit, monkeying with it a little bit, in his own creative work. Rubens, Sprenger and other 17th century Dutch artists, they all did just that. I'll give you another example. Do you remember the movie The Lion King? One of the most popular Disney cartoons in the history of the company. So, they say that during a meeting when discussing the script, one of the executives asked, can we make him King Lear? meaning Shakespeare's tragedy, and one of the screenwriters said, no, but I think we can make him Hamlet. And that's exactly what they did. In fact, if you analyze the plot of The Lion King, you'll see that it's very similar to Hamlet. This was done for a reason. The people who created, who created this cartoon understood that there are really techniques, there are stories, there are plots that have been already time-tested. They work for both adults and children. We simply have to create a different dressing for them. Replace the Prince of Denmark with the cute little lion cub. But the very essence, the essence of the conflict remains the same. And it worked for Shakespeare, and it still works today. It really is an example of how a good acquaintance with the classical literature has helped people create a wonderful product, commercial, but nonetheless highly artistic. So I would argue that being at home with the literature, with philosophy, with mythology, with art is a prerequisite for any successful creative work. A journalist, a copywriter, an advertising professional, a designer, 
all those people can take ideas and borrow images from their great predecessors and use them in their own work. Why might you not like this conclusion? Well, maybe someone would say art is noble and spiritual. It's not about money. Money is such a mundane topic. How can you mix it with the lofty tales of Greek gods and brilliant painters? Frankly, I've always disagreed with the, such an approach. It always seemed to me that there is nothing wrong with the idea of sublime and graceful art being practical and useful at the same time. But as always, I want to know where you stand on this issue. The idea of using art for practical purposes, does it make you cringe? Or, on the contrary, inspires you and spurs you to delve even deeper into art history? And uh, if you choose the second option, don't miss my video the next week, when we uncover yet another secret together. With that said, thank you for watching and I will see you next week. And of course, do not forget to share your opinion in the comment section below.